Let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life.
Well, good morning. I don't know if uh, you had the opportunity of hearing that where you're sitting, but uh, earlier when we uh, read that verse together, we had a little girl up in the front row that kind of was shouting the verse out, uh, one of Pastor Mark's children. Uh, and uh, she got, got done when we, when we recited that together, and she was jumping up and down, bouncing, yelling, I knew that one, right? So there was that excitement of just knowing God's word and remembering God's word, uh, being able to recall God's word. Oh, that all of us had that kind of joy when it came to familiar, familiarity with scripture, right? Uh, just that joy producing thing that scripture does. So today, or actually technically tomorrow, uh, marks the beginning of what we're calling the New Testament challenge. So uh, the sign that we have up here, we get to kind of rip off the begins March 4th uh, here pretty quick at the end of the service because it will have officially begun. 
Uh, what this is, is an opportunity for us as a congregation to do one very simple thing, simply read through the New Testament together. And then, as we're reading it together, gathering together in small groups as we're able, uh, and just talking about what we're reading. Really no big agenda, no pre-study is required. Uh, If you're a leader, there's no additional work that you have to do. Uh, All we have to do is simply read God's word and gather together and talk about it. There's a set of questions. Now you guys can change things up if you want to as a group, uh, if you're in a group. Uh, But simply some of those questions are like, what are you reading? Did anything that you read this last week bother you? In fact, that question, when I first read it, because it was one of the suggested questions, that question bothered me. uh, Because the Bible shouldn't bother us. And then one of our uh, elders, uh, Jerry Cusimano, when we were talking about it, said, that's a phenomenal question, because God's word does bother us sometimes. It shouldn't, but it does. And that's the entire point, right? Uh, the entire point is that there's this conflict that occurs with what, how we're living, what we're thinking, the attitude that we have, the perspective that we hold, and God's word, and it illuminates, and it guides, and it confronts, and we recognize as believers, as we're growing in our faith, that we have to continually realign ourselves to God's word. So that question, did what you read this week bother you, is really a profound question. So my prayer is as you guys begin to get together, we have groups that are starting this week, we have groups that are starting at the end of the week because you guys are gonna be reading first, then meeting together. My prayer is that over the next eight weeks, your conversations in your small groups are gonna grow and become more and more fruitful as you're interacting with God's word. So technically the reading begins tomorrow. Some of you guys are cheating and beginning ahead, so I'm just gonna ask this, that you kind of restart again, so everyone is reading the same thing. If you get behind, okay, so here's kind of the instruction. If, if you get behind, which that happens, <clears throat> excuse me, it's better uh, if instead of like coming in and saying, hey, I'm three weeks behind, so I read you know, three weeks ago, just jump to where everybody else is at. You can always go back later and fill in kind of what you missed. Just kind of keep up with everybody with the current reading. I think that's gonna make your conversations more fruitful. So if you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. Or uh, we also have uh, the text kind of written out in front of us in the handout, but we are gonna be going to other passages of scripture. I'm gonna be sitting down a little bit today just because I'm struggling with my feet uh, a little bit. I just kind of have this gout thing, so uh, I, I might not be as mobile as I normally am, but 2 Peter is a passage of scripture uh, that's gonna be very fitting for what we're talking about today. We're taking a break from Ephesians for the next several weeks. And now, we're gonna be presenting uh, to everybody these sermons or these conversations or these teachings regarding, uh, really regarding the Bible, the word of God. I'm, I'm not gonna try to preach passages on what you're gonna be reading over the next several weeks because Uh, What you're reading is so diverse. You're in different books of the Bible uh, throughout the week and there's really no way for me to kind of just highlight one and ignore everything else. Instead, we're gonna take a more broader overview and just see what scripture says about the Bible itself, right? So today we're looking at three particular truths about the Bible that Peter, the Apostle Peter, gives us. And so we're gonna see those in 2 Peter. And I wanna draw your attention to 2 Peter Uh, chapter one, and if you would join me and look at verse 15. Okay, this is not in your sheet. So if you're looking along your sheet, you gotta kinda go back to the scripture or just listen to me read it. And Peter says this uh, in verse 15. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Now, what are these things? Well, if we would go back and read verses one through 14, Peter is talking about Jesus. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the assurance of our faith and what Jesus has accomplished and who Jesus is. It's it's like this uh, this microchasm or this, this capsule of the gospel itself, and Peter's clearly excited about it. So where are we at timeline in 2 Peter? This is... 
most, most likely the furthest into Peter's life that we have written documentation from him. If you know Peter's history and his story, he was one of the older apostles. Uh, he was the leader among the apostles, if there even was a leader among the apostles. He clearly was very bold, and at times Peter was very foolish. He was the one who kind of rallied the other apostles together, we're gonna serve Jesus. And he also was the one who committed the greatest acts of stupidity and sin against Jesus at the same time, right? Uh, He boldly jumps out and walks after Jesus on the water and, and at the same time, when confronted with the guards at Jesus' soon to be execution in his current torture, he betrays Jesus and denies Jesus. And so we see Peter up and down. And even after uh, the Holy Spirit comes and empowers and emboldens all of the apostles, Peter included, uh, Paul himself had to confront Peter because Peter seemed to be a people pleaser. There was a group that came into the church and they were preaching another gospel. They were preaching legalism and they were a powerful and influential group and Peter, I think, just wanted to be liked. So not only did he allow that to happen, it seems as if he kind of joined into that message and Paul had to interrupt a church service and publicly rebuke Peter for caving into this other group. And yet we still see Peter as this individual who was bold for Jesus. That reminds me or just teaches me uh, that God uses us as believers despite our mistakes and through our sins and he ever draws us closer to himself. And so in 2 Peter, we see a much older Peter, one that's been walking with God for many years, one I think who's learned through the Holy Spirit, through his mistakes and through his foolishness and through the daily empowering of the Holy Spirit. And he writes this letter, uh, along with 1 Peter, he writes this letter to a group of believers that he cares about and he wants to now talk about the subject that excites him the most and that is Jesus. But he's at the tail end of his life So he's been moved by the Holy Spirit to leave a legacy. And the legacy that he wants to leave is the gospel itself. So he writes again in verse 15, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, after my death is what he's talking about, right? After my death, you will always be able to remember these things, hence the writing of the letter that we're looking at this morning. And then he says this, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Stop there for a second. He says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories. Your Bible version may say we did not follow fables. Fables was a little bit of a technical word back in the day, and we use that same word roughly with the same idea. Uh, So we have, say, for example, uh, Grimm and uh, his various stories that we find. And so what those things are in a literature perspective, a fable is a story that everybody takes as being untrue, or mythical or not real, but it sort of proves a various point, right? It has a moral to the story and, uh, and then we all kind of take it that way and everybody knows it as being that. And what he's saying here is, listen, I am not giving you a fable. I am not giving you a fanciful and imaginative and a creative story just to give you a moral lesson. That's not what scripture is. That's not what we've been preaching. That's not what the Old Testament is, that's not what we've been talking about, right? It, it, we don't jump ahead and say, oh, that's a really good life lesson. That's a great moral to the story. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Peter's saying here, it does matter if it's true or not because it's actually true, right? There is a moral to the story, but part of that moral is this stuff actually happened. This is truth. Every detail of it is truth upon which you can build your life. The gospel is different. Christianity is different than every other moral system. It's truth to its very core. We did not follow cleverly invented fables when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom uh, I love and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it. Stop there for a second, okay? He's referring back in those earlier verses uh, to that moment when this voice came from heaven, this Mount of Transfiguration, right? And he hears and he sees, or the baptism of Jesus, he hears God the Father speak audibly about Jesus, this is my son. He remembers that moment. Amen. So let me say this first point that we're trying to make, or Peter rather is trying to make is this. The Bible is completely reliable. In fact, the NIV translates it that way. It says it is completely reliable. Well, let's look at verse 19 again. And we have the word of the prophets. And this version says made more certain, right? NIV, or the newer NIV, I should say, completely reliable. The New American Standard, made more sure. The ESV, more fully, fully confirmed. And the King James, like the New American Standard, it's made more sure. I like how the NIV rendered it in a way. It says it's completely reliable. The Old Testament, Scripture itself, all of it is completely reliable. It's truth to its very core. But as good as that completely reliable translation of the NIV is, it, it misses a subtlety that's found in some of the other renderings. I actually kind of prefer the rendering, it's made more sure. And you think, how does that work, right? Either the Bible is true or it's not true. How is Peter saying that the Bible is now more true than it used to be? Well, it's not exactly what he's saying, but let me put it this way. We have a modern day expression that is somewhat helpful and somewhat problematic. And that expression is this, it's true to me, right? Have you guys heard that? That's sort of the, uh, sort of the, uh, the cultural motif uh, or the shaping of our culture that we find today. There's truth that we can find, sometimes truth that we think we can invent, and we say, well, this is my truth. This is truth for me. And there's like a crazy sort of Oprah way of taking that expression where we can kind of grab all kinds of oddities and falsehoods and just sort of bizarre things and and bring them in and say it's truth for me. I, I, I love it. One of my favorite things to do in the world is to talk to somebody who says I'm an atheist but I'm a very spiritual person, right? I love talking to those individuals because you're like, it's like worldview potpourri, right? It's like you're at some sort of worldview buffet and you're grabbing whatever, I believe there's this force that controls my destiny, but oh, I'm a complete atheist. I don't believe in a God. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? Let's try to unpack that one a little bit. And then the individual says, well, uh, it's true to me, okay? That's the problematic version of, of that idea. But there is a helpful version of that idea as well. Because the reality is that there can be all kinds of truth, not contradictory truth, that's not what I'm saying. But there's all kinds of truth out there in the world. Two plus two equals four. That's a truth, right? Truth that my wife loves me, that's a truth, right? Truth that my kids can sometimes be a problem. That's a truth, right? There's all kinds of truths that are there in our life that these are actual, real, grounded truths. But I might not know it, I might not believe it, I might not be confident about it, and I might not be building my life around those particular truths. They're true, but they're not really true for me. 
Now, I can't undo the truth of it. It's still objectively true, but it's an objective reality that's not entering into my subjective experience. Now, one day, I'm gonna come into conflict with it because it's true and it's unavoidable, but I'm kind of living my life in this bubble as if that's not true for me. Let me give you an example for a non-believer. It's objectively true that Jesus is Lord and Savior. It's objectively true that one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, but that is not a subjectively true experience for the non-believer. But there is coming a day when they will be confronted with that objective reality. They can't escape it forever, ever. They either come to Jesus as Lord and Savior now, or they will be confronted with that reality at their death when they meet the Lord, or when he comes and he returns, right? It's true, they can't undo the truth, but it's not yet entered into their personal experience. And so when Peter uses this phrase, he says this in verse 19, we also have the prophetic message as something, NIV, completely reliable. New American Standard made more sure, ESV, more fully confirmed. What Peter is saying is there is objective truth, (coughs) excuse me, there is objective truth that's now come in and grabbed and entered into our personal, subjective, experiential life. It's more true for us because we're beginning to see it and we're beginning to believe it, right? It is a truth for us. He's not going Oprah on us, but what he's saying here is this objective truth is entering into our life. I love how he renders that. There's this idea, there's this concept, <clears throat> thank you, Amy, uh, that we have. I'll grab this real quick. I'm gonna take a drink and you need to stay where you're at or just keep walking, okay? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. There's this, there's this thing, there's this idea, this concept I think that Peter's trying to get to, right? I've already kind of said this. As believers, we have this odd, bizarre, yet profound, not in a good sense, ability to filter out scriptural truth in our life, all the while pretending that we're following it, right? We've become masters, experts at being spiritual Houdinis, right? Using verbiage, worshiping the glory of God, telling everyone how much we love scripture and love holding to scripture and defending the truth of scripture while conveniently ignoring even some of its most profound and key concepts. And Peter is saying this, we now live in a time period, speaking of when Jesus has come, that the word of God has become more true to us. So there's two sources of Peter's confidence. Source number one is this. He actually met Jesus. Listen to the language that Peter uses again. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That term eyewitnesses is incredibly important. I want you to read what another apostle said. So find in your Bibles, turn to 1 John. 1 John is very easy to find. If you're already in 2 Peter in your Bibles, just flip a book over, right? So just kind of go to the right. 1 John chapter one. So another guy, another apostle, also writing this pretty late in his life, writing for the same purpose, trying to leave a legacy of truth behind for people that he cares about, writes these words in the first chapter of 1 John. This is not the Gospel of John, but rather his first letter. He says this in verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at uh, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That word of life is a reference to Jesus. And he goes on and discusses in a little bit more detail this personal encounter and personal interaction 
with Jesus. So take those two passages together. Peter says this, we have the word of God made more sure. We have all of these prophecies about Jesus. Do you realize that over a hundred, over a hundred prophecies of Jesus have already come true that we have given to us in the Old Testament? So Peter, we lived in a, in a period, we live in a period where everything's sort of kind of past tense. These prophecies have been fulfilled. But Peter was living in a day and age where these things were just literally fulfilled before his very eyes. So he grew up in a context as a young Jewish man where he would go to the synagogue and he would hear the rabbis talking and preaching and teaching about the coming Messiah. And, and he, all the things that would happen, right? The Old Testament predicted, prophesied some details about Jesus which are amazingly specific things. That his hands would be pierced. That he would be so brutally tormented, tortured, and physical abused, but in the process of being tortured and abused, none of his bones would be broken, right? Where he would be born, the exact amount for how much he was betrayed, monetary amount, 30 pieces, I mean, all of these details that were given about Jesus that come true, right? That his clothes would be torn and divided up. Detail after detail after detail, people would renounce him. He would be left all alone. He would be silent during his trial when he was being accused publicly. Detail after detail, over a hundred of these things in the Old Testament. Peter lived during a time period and saw them come true, some of which involved him. For example, people turning and running and denying and leaving him. And Peter realizes that that Old Testament prophecy was in part about him. He brought that prophecy in reality, unwillingly, unknowingly, unintentionally, but he now looks back and he says, it's more fully confirmed. Why? Because there is this truth. It was objective. It was real, whether Peter believed it or not, but that truth entered into his personal, experiential, subjective world. He was confronted with it, and then he uses this phrase, it is made more sure. Why? Because that truth has now hit me in an undeniable way. Not that it's become more true, but it's now more true for him, as it should be more true for you and I. The second thing, that kind of grabbed Peter. First is that he met Jesus, the second is that he read his Bible, right? One, he saw these prophecies come true, but first he read about these prophecies in the Old Testament. So there's these two things. He reads his Bible to see truth, and he relates to Jesus in a personal way to see that truth made even more clear. I love how this thing renders it. The Greek word there that it's either translated made more sure or it's completely reliable simply means this truth is said steadfast. It's settled. It's firmly established. It's the idea of something kind of crawling in and sort of taking up residence and putting down roots like you put a, a, a plant or a seedling to a tree and it kind of grows its roots down deep and it's not going to be moved. I have a couple of trees into my house, which are wonderful. They're oak trees, which is a little bit problematic when you're trying to grow grass, but they're huge, massive, big trees with widow makers all over them. And I know I'm going to wake up one morning with my vehicle crushed in half because this thing fell over and these trees are so massive, they're starting to uproot the sidewalk and I'm just waiting and probably somebody from the city of Jackson is going to hear this and then do it. I'm just waiting for the city of Jackson to give me a citation to fix my sidewalk because the sidewalks are beginning to be upheaved because these roots have settled themselves and I'm dreading the cost of getting those trees removed someday because they're so massive. Can you imagine the amount of labor required to take that thing down and unroot that root system? I can't even imagine it because they're so firmly established. That's this word, right? 
It's truth that's firmly established. It's made more sure. Jesus has come and he's put down roots so deep that you can't remove it no matter how much you ignore him. That's Peter's idea. But then he continues. He says this. We also have the prophetic message of something completely reliable and you would do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. If you're someone that highlights or underlines in your Bible or you can do it uh, in the handout sheet that we have, I wanna draw your attention to a couple of words. First is the word light. Maybe even the word shining as well. Light, shining. The word day or the, the, the dawning of the day. And then particularly the word morning star, right? Or I think the King James Version might use the word day star. Same basic idea. Light that is shining in a dark place, the day that is dawning, and this idea of a morning star. All of those images, kind of roughly the same idea, all taking us to the same place. So what is going on with that concept? Where are those words coming from? Well, one, the concept of light and darkness as a spiritual metaphor is something that we see repeatedly in the Old Testament. Psalm 119, one of the verses in there, I think it's 103, 104, 105, kind of they all kind of, kind of get to the same place, uh, have this idea of a, uh, the word of God is a light unto my path, it's a lamp unto my feet, right? It's this guide that illuminates how we're supposed to walk. The world around us is morally dark if we follow after the the world we follow in blindness, we stumble around spiritually with all of the bumps and the bruises and the damage and the destruction and the danger that that entails, yet the word of God is this light that shows us how we can walk without that stumbling and destruction in our life. God is light, his word is light, the world is darkness. We're very familiar, if you're a student of God's word or grew up in Sunday school or reading the Bible, you've encountered that metaphor before. And maybe you've even heard the phrase morning star that you know it probably has something to do with the same idea, but it gets a little bit deeper, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more nuanced, and incredibly profound. So let's get deep for a second, okay? I want you to turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 24. Numbers 24. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 24. And look specifically at verse 17. This is a prophecy or an oracle that's given uh, about Israel. Really, it's really a, a, about a, a coming figure, this messianic figure in Israel. It's a prophecy, by the way, of Jesus. And it says this in verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab. That was a people group oppressing Israel, right? Sort of served as a, as a real example, but also as a broader metaphor for all who oppose the people of God. The skulls of all of the sons of Sheth, right? But that phrase, a star will come out of Jacob. This is the first glimpse of the tying together of that metaphor that we see in the Old Testament. This coming messianic figure will be a light, will be a star in the midst of darkness. So that's early in the Bible. <clears throat> We're gonna look at two more passages. Now jump with me all the way to Revelation chapter 22. Now I could just read this uh, and if you want, you can kind of just sit there and have me read it to you. I think you're gonna find it more profound if you see scripture with your own eyes. Again, to use Peter's illustration or his wording, I want the truth of God not simply to be true, which it is, I want it to be true for you. I want it to be made more sure for you. 
And I think when you have that tactile experience of finding it on your iPhone or flipping to the pages of scripture for yourself and looking at it and reading with it with your own eyes, my prayer is that this scripture hits you in a way that it wouldn't if I just simply told you about it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Jesus' words. So if you've got a red letter Bible, you get Jesus' words in red letters. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star, right? So here Jesus is reaching all the way back to the book of Numbers where we first see this seed, this idea that this coming messianic figure is going to be a light. Not simply a light, but a light that illuminates and a light that leads. A light that gives us a direction for which way to go. Imagine as a seafarer trying to figure out which direction to go or you're lost in the wilderness and you don't know which direction to go. It's the middle of the night. You look up and you see this bright star that not only illuminates your dark path, but it also gives you a direction in which to go and a guide for living your life. And Jesus says, I am that star. But it's more profound and it's deeper than him simply being a star. It's the morning star, the star that we see as morning begins to dawn and begins to break, which means this, more light is coming. An explosion of truth, an explosion of glory, an explosion of chasing away all darkness and all corners of wickedness is coming and there is coming a time that Jesus is saying in Revelation 22 that all darkness will be banished and you as a believer can look forward to an eternity where there is only light. There is only Jesus, only goodness, only joy, only life, only an eternity, only perfection. He is the morning star that breaks in with the dawn and light is banished for all of eternity. That is Jesus. And that is what Jesus has promised. And that is what Jesus delivers. But it gets even deeper still. So if you join me now with the last passage I wanna take us to, and that is Isaiah chapter 14, because this is not the only time that we see this image of light. So if you're trying to find Isaiah, you don't know where it is, open your Bible sort of like this, right? Let it flop open to the middle. You're probably, probably in Psalms. Just go a little bit to the right, and you're gonna find Isaiah, right? So Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 12. A passage that seems to have nothing to do with Jesus. This passage is about Satan. Actually, it's kind of about two individuals at the same time. There's this human king that is being uh, rebuked, right? There's some prophecies about him, but there's also at the same time serving as uh, a warning to and a prophecy about even Satan. And the idea here is that Satan is pulling his chain. He's the puppet master behind the evil, as he is with everybody, right? So not only is this human king, different people inter- interpret Isaiah 14 different ways. I happen to fall into, I think what the majority view is, is that this human king is being rebuked, but God also takes the opportunity to rebuke the puppet master who's behind and manipulating this. And he says this in verse 12, about basically Satan. How far you have fallen from heaven. O morning star, son of dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who were once laid low to the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly. On the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most 
high, but you are brought down to the graves, to the depths of the pit, right? And it goes on, and actually even before that, it describes this fall of Satan where he wanted more than what he had been given. Now we take from here and other places in the Old Testament, what do we know about Satan? He seems to have been the pinnacle, the most glorious aspect of God's creation up until that point, right? So this is seemingly before the creation of earth and humanity and animals, right? There is this whole spiritual world that God created. Angels are not eternal kind of going backwards. They're like you and I in that regards. They have an actual beginning. They've not always been around. They're not God. They are creation. They are created. Only God is eternally self-existing. Only God is creator. They had a beginning, but there was this pinnacle, this gloriously beautiful and profoundly wise creature that seems to have been more glorious, more profound, more wise, more majestic than any other created being, and that is Lucifer, now known as Satan. He was referred to as the morning star, this display of glory and truth and righteousness and brightness. So let's put all this together. Most theologians tend to believe that what this means is Satan's original role was to be the living embodiment of a perpetual testimony to God's greatness and God's glory, and he was to shine that forth in a way and to a degree unlike any other created creature. And it was gonna be glorious and wonderful, except Satan wanted something different. His original role was to broadcast light and glory, right? But instead of doing that role, he ushered in darkness. He rejected his role as the morning star, and he instead grabbed a role as the bringer of darkness instead of the bringer of life. That entity, that individual, which is supposed to be a light for all of the nations which were to become, is the very individual who wanted to grab a hold of what had been given to humanity, the scepter of dominion over the earth, and grab that mantle for himself. If he can't be king and lord over heaven, He will try to be king and Lord and God of this age, the Bible tells us, over the created world. And he wrestles that scepter of authority away from Adam and he becomes now a ruler, a ruler of darkness instead of a ruler of light. And you think, why in the world is Satan referred to as the morning star and then we see Jesus as being referred to the morning star? Let me take you to some words of Jesus when he was dying on the cross and he cries out, It is finished. Do you have any idea how remarkably remarkably profound those words are? He's referring to salvation. He's referring to the defeat of sin and the defeat of Satan. He's referring to the fulfilling of all of these various roles. My husband is probably not the best way of phrasing that. My, my act of being a husband, my role of being a husband is taken to Jesus. Jesus is the perfect husband, right? Jesus is the perfect son. Jesus is the perfect kingdom. Jesus is the perfect groom. Jesus is the, all of these things that Jesus fulfills. He's referred to in part, in part, as the son of God because that role, the son of God, was given to the people of God, first to Israel and now by extension and inclusion, the church itself, right? All peoples of God, Gentile or uh, Jew, we are the sons, the collective son of God, imperfect though we are, but there is a perfect son who takes the role that we were always to play and he comes and shows us what a real perfect true son is like Jesus is the great completer and this is how far it goes not only does he complete our role he was 
and is obedient when we were not. He was good when we were not. He was the one who establishes dominion over the earth. When we willingly gave up that dominion literally to the first deceiver who came along, Jesus completes that and he even completes the role originally assigned to Satan to be the bringer uh, of light. And Jesus is essentially saying this, prophesied in the book of Numbers, realized in Revelation 22, even that individual, that entity, that person, which is now your greatest enemy as a believer, who deceives and harms and enslaves, he originally had a role, and that role was to reveal the triune glory of God. I take that role. I now fulfill that role. It is finished. Amen. So the second point that John or Peter makes is this, that not only is the Bible reliable, the Bible is a light, it's a guide, right? It's a truth that we can live our lives according to. And then he says this, above all, verse 20, you must understand that no interpretation or, or prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For a prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through, though human I should say, but prophets though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's saying essentially this. Listen, the, the Bible is this remarkably diverse book. It is written over a span of about 1,500 years. 40 different authors, three different language, written from three different continents, right? All over the place. Africa, Asia, Europe, right? So you have these areas that this thing is literally written from. Spanning, like I said, over 1,500 years. But there is this profound unity, a variety of literary styles. Some people who could write with almost a technical precision. So you only kind of get this when you kind of get into like the heady stuff like Greek and Hebrew, but Luke, for example, uses medical precise terms that probably most people in his day didn't even know. I mean, he spoke in such a way that if they had a dictionary back then, they'd be like, dude, I have totally got to get a dictionary when you're talking because I got no idea what you're even talking about, right? So he uses these very heady technical words. Translators kind of dumb those down for us a little bit because who wants to use technical words? But you have Luke, who is like this profoundly intelligent guy. And then you have Mark. Mark is amazing. In fact, uh, most Greek classes in seminary nowadays, they used to use Mark, but they don't use Mark anymore. There's a reason for that because Mark uses horrible, dumb grammar. He makes grammar mistakes all the time. So if you wanna learn Greek, you can't use Mark because he doesn't even speak it correctly, right? He makes all kinds of grammatical mistakes. He's not nearly as educated uh, as Luke was. God uses him, uses his style. Then you got Paul, the theologian, and then you have David, the poet, right? You have all, and then of course Luke is a little bit of a, of a history guy as well. Uh, and then you have these people who, like Moses, who wrote these incredibly profound narratives, these historical biographies almost, of what occurred and when it occurred. You have all of these differences in terms of style and education level. And so you have uh, Peter saying that though they are human, Though the stamp of their humanity is clearly found in the pages of scripture, which is why Paul sounds different than Moses, who sounds different than Isaiah, who sounds different than Jude, right? The stamps of their humanity, Peter says this, don't let that get in the way. Don't let that confuse you. Don't let that mislead you because there is a profound underlying tie to all of these writings, all of this diversity that we find in scripture, and that diversity is all tied together by one singular truth. This comes from God. It doesn't come from them. 
Mark's bad grammar, Luke's precise medical terms, Paul's theological verbiage, David's poetry, ultimately none of this comes from them. They were carried along. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. And as Peter is getting old and he sees his death in front of him, he wants his people to remember three things. The truth in front of you He would say now, to use our language, your copy of God's word is reliable. It's been made even more sure because Jesus has now come. Your copy of God's word that you have in front of you is a light when the world offers darkness and confusion. Your God offers you a path to live your life. And three, make no mistake, what you are holding what you are reading, what you are gathering together for the next eight weeks talking about is nothing less than the word of God given for you. As a light, as a reliable God, a reliable guide, this is God's word. So here's my prayer for you this week. As you read this, we have a profound truth. We have two things. We have Jesus as the living word. What that means, we're gonna take communion here in a few moments. Jesus as the living word is this. Jesus' life and death and resurrection, the brokenness of his body, the taking on of our sins, the rising above and defeating sin and throwing off death, that is a living word. It's living truth. And then you get the joy. You get the joy of picking up this iPhone or actual old school paper Bible copy, right? You get the joy of picking up God's word, reading his written word, and seeing that written word confirmed in the living word, and like Peter, we can say this is true, but it is truth now made more sure for you and for all who put their faith in Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God, may we see Jesus as light, as guide. May we see your word through that same lens. This is your truth, your message. And Father, my prayer for all who are taking part in this Bible reading challenge over the next eight weeks is that we would be humbled, that we would be reverent, that we would be impacted, that we would allow our intellectual lives, our moral lives, our emotional lives, Lord, to be completely in, completely impacted, completely invested with what we're reading and may it shape us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen.